Simple Harmonic Motion, Part 2. We have three goals today. So we're going to look at the equations we use for position, velocity, and acceleration in Simple Harmonic Motion, as well as the graphs that go with those. We'll look at the neat connection there is between uniform circular motion and simple harmonic motion. And we'll also take a little look at the simple pendulum, just a mass on a spring, on a, sorry, string, a ball on a string, which also exhibits simple harmonic motion as long as the displacements are small. Okay, so here we have a set of motion graphs. We're plotting here position, velocity, and acceleration of an object on a spring as it oscillates back and forth. These are all plotted as a function of time. And this gives us the following as shown. And you can see here that the period of the graph, which is the time, the period of the, sorry, the oscillation, which is the time for one complete oscillation, is four seconds. You can get that, that off either one of those three graphs. Okay, so that's the motion. And you can see that we can fit these with sines and cosines. And so our equation for position as a function of time is a cosine omega t, omega being what we call the angular frequency. Now, that works as long as at t equals zero, the object is at x is positive a, the maximum displacement point. If it's not, you've got to amend your equation a little bit. But if that is the position equation, then you get the corresponding velocity equation minus a omega sine omega t, and the largest value that sine omega t can be is 1, so that means your maximum speed is going to be a times omega. A similar way we get an equation for acceleration as a function of time, minus a omega squared cosine omega t. Looks a lot like the x equation, right? It's just the x equation multiplied by omega squared. And so, again, the largest value cosine omega t can be is 1, and so your maximum acceleration has a magnitude of a omega squared. And again, omega here is known as the angular frequency. Okay, so here we have two objects that, is, that are going to experience uniform circular motion and two equivalent blocks which are attached to springs. And then we're going to plot the motion separately, the x and y components of the motion, the circular motion, separately to the right and below the circular motion here. Okay, so what's, what we're going to see is that the x and y components separately of uniform circular motion follow simple harmonic motion. And we can understand the equation that we get for x as a function of time by looking at that connection. Okay, so we'll set this into motion. So I hope what you see on your screen is the two objects going around in circular paths at the same angular speed, constant value. And you will see that the block on the spring exactly matches one component of the motion of the thing that's going through circular motion. And we could have put vertical springs on the right-hand side, and we could have those motions match the vertical motion of the balls that are going through uniform circular motion. We see this very cool connection between circular motion and harmonic motion, right? They are the same motion. The harmonic motion is exactly the same as one component of the circular motion. Okay, so if you plot the x component, we can say x is our cosine theta, but theta is simply omega t. It's a constant angular velocity, and so we can write that as x is our cosine omega t. And that is exactly pretty much what we wrote down for our position as a function of time equation for circular motion. Now in those equations, omega was all over the place. So what is it that determines angular frequency? So we'll look at the, the block on the spring. So in general, what we see is the acceleration is uh, opposite in direction to the displacement, proportional to it, and the proportionality constant is omega squared. So for any specific case, we can analyze the forces. So here we can do some of the forces equals ma. And the only force that really matters here is the horizontal force applied by the spring. The normal force from the table match balances the gravitational force. 
Okay, so in this case we get minus kx is ma, and so a is minus k over m times x. So that's the specific application of Newton's second law to this certain, this particular case. And so we compare that to our general equation, a is minus omega squared x, and we can see that omega squared is therefore k over m, or in other words, omega is root k over m. So for a block on a spring, the angular frequency is the square root of the spring constant of the spring divided by the mass of the block. And that makes some sense, right? The stiffer the spring, the faster it's going to oscillate, and the heavier the block is, the slower it's going to oscillate. Okay, so now we'll turn our attention to the pendulum. And if we just have a ball and a string at rest, then the tension force balances the mg. But if it's actually moving, it's, it's oscillating back and forth, left and right, on the string, then the tension force as it passes through equilibrium is larger than the mg force. There's that centripetal acceleration we have to include. Okay. And so, if we do this free body diagram when the pendulum is displaced to the left here, then we can split the mg force into components, and we can analyze the pendulum by taking torques around the support points. So you follow the string back to where it's tied to the support, and we'll take torques around there. Sum of all the torques is I times alpha. Okay, so the only one of those three forces that gives any torque is the mg sine theta force. The other two pass through the um, support points that don't give any torques. So L is the length of the string, mg sine theta is the force, and we set that equal to mr squared, where r equals L, that's the inertia for the ball on the string, times alpha. Okay, so we can rewrite that as A is minus g over L sine theta, and for small angles we can get away with the approximation sine theta is approximately theta. Small angles are typically 10 or less, 10 degrees or less. This leads to alpha is minus g over L theta, and that is a simple harmonic motion form. And so we can pick off the angular frequency for the uh, pendulum, and you note that it does not depend at all on mass. It only depends on what planet you're on and the length of the pendulum itself. Okay, so that's a kind of neat result for the ball on the string, independent of mass. Okay, and that is it for our circular or simple harmonic motion preview.